Hi. Hello. Hi, Dr. Moscow. Hi, Saeed. Hi, everybody. How are you? Hi. Hi. It's, it's great to see you and thank you for being here. Uh, we have been waiting. A lot of people have joined already and excited to kick off. Please, if you would like to introduce yourself and let us know why you are here. I would love to hear that and I'm sure many people are excited to hear that as well. Well, I'm Cindy Mossbrooker. I've been doing uh, endometriosis excision since 2006 uh, when I went to join D David Redwine for two years. Uh, he taught me an awful lot. And uh, in 2008, I came up here to Gig Harbor and I've been doing my practices about 80% endometriosis and pelvic pain and about 20% urogynecology. Uh, I'm board certified in urogynecology. There is no board certification in uh, endometriosis surgery, but uh, Saeed's trying to create uh, uh, the next best thing, which is uh, the I Care Better Registry, which uh, I uh, am a huge fan of and uh, um, helped, to, helped to create. So um, here I am, and uh, we're going to talk about endo, and uh, it's a beautiful day here outside of Seattle, although uh, it was prettier this morning. The clouds rolled in this afternoon, but uh, it's still not raining yet, so we're good. <laughs> All right, so we're going to take the opportunity of not having the rain and kick this off. So you talked about your training with Dr. Redwine. I always was wondering about you and and so you know it, it's obvious you are one of the top surgeons it's it really made me curious what what was the first time that you saw an endometriosis patient and and how that led to you the, to the decision to go and do this fellowship with dr redwine and become an endometriosis surgeon i'm really curious about it we never talked about this before well the the uh the first endo patient that I remember I was a resident I was a, I believe a third year resident and this girl the I mean I now I look back at that surgery and I feel so bad because she had uh, she had a big mass in her rectum uh, she had endometriomas and you know this was back in 1993 probably uh, you know we had to open her up and we got a general surgeon in there to do a bowel resection. And I, I can't remember what we did with their ovaries, if we did cystectomies or we just took them out. I, I have a feeling we may have just taken everything out. Um, and I, I remember to this day how I felt when I looked at her belly because it was like, my God, a bomb went off in here. And so that, you know, that stuck with me. And I would see these patients with endo and, um, you know, we were just taught to go in there and burn the, you know, burn the spots that we saw and, you know, give them birth control pills. Um, they were the Lupron reps. Uh, when I was a resident, they would take all the boys to the to uh, the baseball games and the basketball games and, and the football games. They they ignored us girls, uh, which kind of pissed me off. But it was fine because I didn't like their uh, I didn't like Lupron even back then. I didn't like Lupron because of all the side effects people had on it, and I didn't think that they had decent data. So time went on, and you know I kind of was focusing on urogynecology and and doing a lot of bladder stops and prolapse stuff, and um, and um, sorry, I gotta switch my positioning here. I got a kind of a gimpy arm, and I'm holding my not used to hold my phone up like this uh so um but you know i'd seen enough endo patients um and i knew that what we were doing wasn't really the right thing to do and i began feeling that you know i was pretty good at surgery and and when i was in so i got out of the navy and i moved to hawaii and I was in Hawaii, and I, I got to be known as kind of the the resource gynecologist at our hospital, and, and people would call me when they were having trouble with things and, you know, couldn't get babies out and things like that. 
And I, I began feeling like there was something else I was supposed to be doing, you know, kind of like that little angel is sitting on your shoulder tapping you saying, you know, there's something else for you to be doing. And about that time, uh, I, uh, I read an ad in the Green Journal that Redwine had put in there that he was looking for somebody to come join his practice. And a couple other things were, were going on. Our parents were getting older and we need to be closer to home and, and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, it, uh, I, I, we corresponded by email for a while and then I flew out to bed and spent a week with him and was just fascinated by what he did because what he did was everything that I wanted to do when I was in med school, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. I love general surgery. I love urology. I love gynecology. And I really had a hard time trying to figure out, you know, which specialty should I, uh, should I go into? What, you know, what should I do? And, um, and so now, I'm doing all three of them and, you know, and, and so I knew I fell in love with endosurgery the minute that I walked into his OR and saw what he did. I thought this is phenomenal. Amazing. So, so that actually tells how complex these endometriosis cases are that you needed to, to need it to be the three type of surgeons that you wish you could be to be able to handle these patients. And with that, that actually is a great bridge to our main, discussion about endometriosis uh, for today, which is about suboptimal and ineffective surgeries done mostly by non-experts, right? And to, to, get, uh, to get these things off the ground, can you tell us, please, like, what is a, a suboptimal, aka ineffective endometriosis surgery? What describes that? Well, I mean, it's basically a surgery that doesn't fix the patient's pain. It doesn't excise all of the visible endometriosis, or at least most of it. Um, and and the the problem is is really multifactorial. Um, endo is a very complicated. Uh, disease process and it requires expert surgeons to be able to remove it especially when it's overlying the ureters when it's on in the bowel wall when it's um, on the on the diaphragm and uh, all these places and um, and even when it's just in the in the cul-de-sac in the rectovaginal septum uh, and, it, and it's not invading the bowel wall, but you have to know where it is. Once you learn the patterns, once you've done it enough, you can, you can, you know, look at a pelvis and, and have a pretty good idea of, okay, how do I need to approach this? There's a, there's a stepwise, um, approach in your technique that I, that I teach my fellows, the, the one fellow that I had that unfortunately is not here anymore. Um, but uh, that I that I teach people who are interested. Um, the the big push lately over the last few years by the endo advocacy community, which I kind of call the Me Too, the Me Too of endo movement, um, has raised awareness amongst gynecologists that they need to do excision. The problem is, is that if those people are not trained to do excision, they don't go deep enough. And so what happens is they take off half a lesion, like on the uterosacral ligaments. Endo can be uh, five to 10 millimeters deep, which is like a centimeter deep. And they're shaving off two or three millimeters because they're afraid of what's beneath there because they don't know. They, they have not... But Sorry. Sorry, my finger, I was over the mic. Okay. Um, I'm used to doing these on computers. I've never done one on my phone, and it's, <laughs> it's bizarre. Um, so at any rate, uh, so these doctors are, there's they're, some of them are really trying. And um, they're trying to do the right thing, but they haven't been taught how to do excision appropriately. And so, so they cut through the middle of the lesion and they leave half of it or more behind. 
And what happens is, is that it's, it's kind of like poking the bear. You're poking the sleeping bear and the endo gets worse. And so I've, I've talked to so many patients that their pain gets worse after they have uh, incomplete excision because all those nerve endings, so endometriosis makes a substance called nerve growth factor. And nerve growth factor does exactly what you would think that it does, which is to grow new nerve endings. And endo in the, uh, in the uterus sacrals specifically, because there's a lot of nerves in, in, uh, in the uterus sacrals, but deeply infiltrating endo uh, grows all these nerves. And when you cut through the middle of it, it exposes those nerve endings. And it's kind of like picking the scab off of a wound. And it just makes it so much more sensitive. And so I've, I've uh, had, I can't tell you how many patients um, who have worse pain after quote unquote excision by, um, by somebody who's trying but really doesn't know. The bigger problem is when somebody has, uh, adeno or, uh, has an endometrioma and the endometrioma is drained but not excised. And um, when the endo is, when the endometrioma cyst wall is partially left in there and then the, and then the defect in the ovary is not closed, what tends to happen is that the ovary will stick down over the top of the fallopian tube and then pinch that tube between the, between the uterus and the sidewall basically burying the fimbria, which is the end of the fallopian tube that reaches out and sucks up the egg and brings it into the uterus and allows for fertilization to happen. So women who have endometriomas, I, I really firmly believe that women with endometriomas uh, need to have endo surgery done by a specialist, uh, especially if they want to preserve their fertility. Um, and I think that the, the push that we need to make that you advocates can make um, is to is somehow we need to get ACOG to recognize that specialists are needed for endosurgery just like they're needed for cancer surgeries. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to do a diagnostic laparoscopy and take pictures and say, yes, you have endo. Uh, go see somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, it's one thing to, you know, try to treat stage one endometriosis, uh, especially in somebody who doesn't have infertility or they're not trying to conceive or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. and, and have generalists do those kinds of things. But I think for in, uh, bowel, bowel nodules, for mm -hmm. endometriomas, uh, for advanced stage disease, certainly for stage four disease, mm -hmm. um, it needs to be done by experts because we don't need to have 26, 28 year old women be castrated because that's how somebody was taught 20 years ago. And the teaching hasn't changed to keep up with the, the right. data and the technology. Right. So Dr. Mosberg, you, you touched upon many important points. Some of them I'm, I really want to drill down on, on those points because I'm pretty sure that patients are also really confused. First of all, I want to tell my own experience. I have spoken with AGL trained uh, surgeons. They, I, they told me they have seen like two or three cases during their entire three years of fellowship, which talks to what you just said about like lack of experience. Uh, and also, I want to invite patients to ask their questions when Dr. Mosbeck is talking. I'll, I'll take note and I'll make sure that I ask her that question. I know she's talking, it's hard to read and and talk, but I'll, I'll make sure I ask your questions. So when you started describing what's, what's an ineffective surgery or suboptimal surgery, the first thing you said was cut, excise, cut out every visible lesion. I think that's where the problem starts. Many, there are many lesions which might be visible to you, but not necessarily visible to a non-expert. Can you tell us what are subtle lesions? How a patient goes to a laparoscopy and comes back and you see like a ton, other, a ton of other lesions that was never even touched. Some of them have been cut in the middle, made the pain worse, 
but some of them is like they were non-existent no one saw them what are subtle visions why they are missed well i'll tell you that in a minute but you know the other problem is is that um so many so many patients that that have excision done by somebody who says they do excision and by some people who claim to be specialists um you know and then the patient comes back with pain and then those doctors treat the patients like they're nuts because well you you know how can you have pain i remove i removed your disease but they only removed part of it or maybe they didn't even remove any of it they just burned it and they did one little biopsy and then they claim to do excision when they really aren't doing excision um so as far as what does uh what does endo look like um the classic lesions of endo are these big blue black uh things that are raised that clearly you can see that there's been bleeding into those lesions um and um and that the the uh endometrial glands and stroma which is the definition of so the definition of endometriosis is endometrial glands and stroma outside the um the endometrial cavity so that can be so the glands obviously secrete uh things whether that's uh blood or mucus or other things like that the the endometrial glands typically will will cause make blood and inflammatory substances the stroma is kind of the bed or the background uh uh tissue that the glands live in and so when endometriosis is found what it is is it's this type of tissue that is found outside of the lining of the uterus the endometrial cavity and so um when those glands are bleeding and uh just like the lining of the uterus bleeds every month the endometriosis bleeds every month and um and so uh you will find these black and and blue and sometimes red lesions the red lesions are more inflammatory um and uh so these are the lesions that most people are are trained to look for um you can certainly have um you can certainly have white lesions uh we call them terrain changes where it looks like a cobblestone on the peritoneum um it would be uh you know we should have uh pictures for this because it would be a lot easier to, to show pictures and we try to describe them um your voice your voice just just yeah it's good. sorry no problem i keep uh keep holding this the wrong way can we do it this way no then my hand is no no, no. how about no. here no no i'm sideways no. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Um do you have your phone on a stand? Yes, yes. I I I should have told See, you. This is all Saeed's fault. He didn't tell me what to expect. I was expecting like a Zoom webinar or something all like right. that, you know, on my computer like always. So Sorry, next time um, I promise I make a, I'll I'll do a better job. All right. Um so so these subtle lesions uh they can be clear they can look like uh vesicles which are blisters basically um and uh and and then in teenagers uh you just see this stuff that kind of looks like bubbling up of of the tissue and um teenage endo doesn't look like uh endo in any of the books uh it doesn't look like the way anybody ever taught anybody really how to how to look at it it's it's very different um but it is but it is um i've found it in many teenage girls even 14 15 year olds that i've operated on um the other problem with gynecologists not recognizing endo is that i've seen pictures from laparoscopies where they didn't even put somebody in enough trendelberg which is a head down position so when we operate we put somebody on the operating table and then we position the bed so that your butt goes up in the air and your and your shoulders go down 
And what that does is it allows all the intestines to come up out of the pelvis so that we can see the uterus, the ovaries, the cul-de-sac, which is behind the cervix, between the rectum and the, and the cervix, and the sidewalls. And then I look all the way back to the sacrum because you can have endometriosis uh, all the way back to the, to the sacrum hiding underneath the rectum that you're not going to see unless you have somebody in the right position to look there. And so, so many doctors just won't even see anything because they don't bother to look close enough. Mm-hmm. Right. So, the, so pro- basically, the, there are some visibility issues, like non-typical lesions, and also there are lesions... Oh, are you... Sorry, I missed you for a second. So, there are some lesions that don't have typical appearance. Some lesions are deep down, which makes that those subtle lesions. So, what I... So, and also you actually um, mentioned that and you answered that, but I wanted to ask it from another perspective because some people have, contact, have, have asked this question already. If someone which is not an expert and has gone into to do a surgery and comes out and they say it was negative, that I didn't find anything, and that, that's a non-expert saying this, how... Like, what's the next step? The patient is still in pain. They have pelvic pain. And the result of the first laparoscopy, by any reason, was negative. And that surgeon wasn't, a, wasn't an expert in endometriosis. What, what's the next step for a patient? What does that mean? Well, something is causing the pain. And endometriosis is not the only uh, disease that causes pain in the pelvis. So in my experience the most common thing that is causing pelvic pain in women with a negative laparoscopy is the uterus. And so um, there, there, are, there are patients who, so when I, when I see a patient for the first time, I try to get the op reports, uh, but more importantly, I try to get the photographs from their last surgery so that I can see what's actually going on rather than that doctor's interpretation of what they think is going on. And so I would say some of the negative uh, laparoscopies, meaning that they did a laparoscopy, they didn't see anything. Um, Some of them really are truly negative and everything looks pretty much okay. Uh, Some of them, they're from 30,000 feet up, and they didn't go close enough to see the subtle lesions. They didn't, you know, they didn't get the bowel out of the pelvis. They didn't really look good enough to, to say for sure that everything's okay. And then sometimes patients, so most gynecologists don't have patients stop their birth control pills before their surgeries. Um, and, uh, and so if somebody's got subtle disease, Um, They don't have these big blue and black lesions, which tend to be older lesions that have been there for a long time, and and the endometriosis has had a chance to bleed month after month after month for years. Um, And so they've got got subtle lesions, uh, and they are on birth control pills. A lot of times you won't see them. And so um, that's another reason for a negative laparoscopy is that if somebody has a, has a, a negative lap, on OCPs, I don't really trust it, especially if they're young, you know, in their early 20s or, or teens. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's, that's great. So and with that question, I want to go to the next, because you just mentioned like in people in 20s or if they are teen and they have that pain, so the, neg- the negative laparoscopy can be something, but the other thing is they go actually do some surgery. How and many of these people in their 20s or, or in the, when they are 10 or 20, they still might think about having a family or having babies in the future. How a suboptimal, or a suboptimal surgery by a non-expert can impact fertility? In, in somebody with early stage disease or somebody with advanced stage disease? I think either. If you could like, explain in, in either scenario, that would be great. So in, in early stage disease, um, fortunately, there's not too much that can, can go on, um, that can go wrong. Um, I mean, unless the, you know, the patient is persistent and says, well, doc, you know, you didn't see any endometriosis, then 
you know, it must be my uterus and, you know, what else is going on? And then the doc says, well, you need a hysterectomy. And then they go in and they take out their uterus and their ovaries. Um, fortunately, I am seeing that less today than I did um, 16, 17 years ago when I started on this road. But it still can happen. Um, for for um, patients with a little bit of, of uh, adhesions between their ovaries and the sidewalls, you know, a lot of doctors will go in and they'll just go muck around and they'll say, oh, you had adhesions, I freed them up. Well, what happens is they make more scar tissue by doing that and then they don't do a, a clean surgery, meaning that there's blood and there's uh, scarring and, and things like that, that that happen after that surgery. Um, and then the ovaries scar down and then the this, uh, when an ovary is scarred, it... it promotes pain every month when you ovulate from that so um so uh for advanced stage and uh sorry it's confusing me i'm seeing these questions pop up on the screen and i'm trying to answer things we'll, that i'm reading um we'll answer these questions at the end don't worry uh, yeah we'll answer all of them is there a way you can take them off of what i'm seeing i don't know. I I have never been able to do that. No, I'm unfortunately no. Okay. Just probably. All right. Um. So in in women with endometriomas, um, it I think it is very dangerous to fertility or can be, uh, if the wrong person does your surgery, and the reason is is that um, there is a there is a plain. Uh, meaning a tissue plane, uh, so a line of demarcation uh, between the endometrioma, which is the cyst wall, which contains endometriosis, and the normal ovary. And it's kind of like, you know, my shirt here, there's a, you know, if there's pressure on, on the, out, the outer, the scrub shirt, you know, there's really no space between my scrubs and my t-shirt. But if we get in there and we get into the right space, you know, then there's there's a nice plane that you can develop that will allow the cyst wall to come out just like shelling an orange out of an orange peel. So, but in the endometrioma example, the orange, the part that you eat is like the endometrioma and the orange peel is the normal ovary that you want to leave behind. So you want it like one of those satsuma little tangerines that you get at christmas time that you just get in there and the orange comes right out and the shell just stays where it is and if you know what you're doing you can do that and it's and it's uh you know some are more difficult than others but for the most part it's it's doable and it's relatively easy uh to stay in that plane um <coughs> so so that you can just get the endometrioma out and leave as much normal ovary as you possibly can. Um, doctors that are not used to doing cystectomies, they will either whack out the whole ovary, so they'll just take that whole ovary out, or they'll take a bunch of normal ovarian tissue with the endometrioma, and the more ovary you take out, the more damage there is to the ovarian reserve. Ovarian reserve is your ability to ovulate and to produce eggs. Therefore, ovarian reserve is linked to your ability to, to get pregnant. Right. So that's that's incredibly important. Just just thinking about how how a, a not important like not a, a suboptimal surgery can in, can impact one's over. It really can define the future of that person's decision if they if they want to have a baby or or whatever right and, and then what i was saying what i was saying before is a lot of gynecologists will just go in especially if there's a frozen pelvis which a frozen pelvis is bilateral endometriomas stuck to the sidewall stuck to the colon and stuck to the uterus and so all these things are stuck together and uh and they don't so they look in there, they don't have the ability uh, or the skill set to free those adhesions up to get the disease out to basically fix the problem. 
So what they do is they're thinking, okay, well, part of this is a pressure problem because there's this big enemy trauma, so I'll drain it. So they poke a hole in the ovary. They suck the bloody fluid out of, out of the ovary. And uh, sometimes they'll take part of the cyst wall out. Uh, sometimes they'll just poke a hole and drain it and leave it uh, and call it good. And that is what does so much damage to the fallopian tubes. So um, if I have a patient who has never had surgery and they've got bilateral endometriomas, I tell them that there's a 98% chance that I can save both fallopian tubes. Uh, because if they've never had surgery, endo usually doesn't affect the tubes very much. And if it does, it does, it's on the outside of the fallopian tubes, we can shave that part off and we can leave the inner fallopian tube intact and the fimbria are, are good. The fimbria are the part that go out and suck up the uh suck up the egg and uh and bring it into the uh bring it into the uterus um and so but when the when they've had surgery before especially for a cystectomy or for a draining of an endometrioma then the fimbria or the tube has probably a, a 25 percent chance of getting uh damaged by that incomplete excision of the of the ovarian cyst and even people who do cystectomies correctly but they leave the ovary open so i don't know if you can see my hand but if if this yes. is this is a closed round ovary if you do a cystectomy you've got basically what i call an ovarian pancake and so this ovary just has this big flat surface and it can just stick on anything it wants to stick to generally it will stick to the pelvic sidewall which is underneath the ovary or it'll stick to the uterus a lot of times the tube will get underneath there and it will stick down over the top of the tube which is why i always close the ovary i sew it closed um there is a little bit of controversy about whether or not you should do that some people really think you should other people uh don't think you should um and uh, I was trained by Dr. Redwine to do it, and I think that it makes total sense because it prevents it, it, it minimizes the risk of adhesion of the ovary to the ureter uh, and the uterine vessels. It minimizes the risk of the uh, damage to the fallopian tube, and it, uh, and it doesn't do, some studies have shown that it that it decreases ovarian reserve very slightly. Other studies have shown that it doesn't do anything to ovarian reserve. So I think it's worthwhile right. doing. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's it's so important to know this uh, for a patient who just wants to start the journey and just learn that she might have diagnosis or has a confirmed diagnosis, but no three no no excision or ablation surgery so with that i'm going to jump into questions people have asked many great great questions very smart questions and i have always said like people with endometriosis they are so very so well read and they do so much research the question is just spot on i'll start with questions in the question section then i'll go into comments uh, the first question is thank you so much dr mosbacher from your perspective why isn't excision widely accepted as the gold standard for treatment? Why is it that do that ACOG doesn't recognize this surgical skill? How can we be advocates? Uh, if I knew the answer to that question, I would uh, I would be on the a beach in the south of France someplace. Um, I I don't know. The only thing that I can think of is is ego. Um, and the fact that for years and years and years and years, including now, they have been teaching their residents. So ACOG um, is probably the, the leading voice in what determines uh, the curriculum for residencies. Uh, and it, that's mediated through CREOG, which is the Council on Resident Education in OBGYN. And so ACOG and CREOG are basically partners uh, in creating the, the curriculum for, uh, for residency education. And, um, and residents are taught to burn endo and then give Lupron. Um, in this day and age, it's probably burn endo and give, 
or Alyssa. Doesn't matter. Lupron and Alyssa are basically one and the same. <clears throat> they both have the same kind of issues and, and problems uh, and side effects. Okay. Um, great. So the next. Wait, I'm not is... done. Oh, I'm sorry, not sorry. done. <laughs> and so, to to accept uh, excision as the gold standard, they would have to admit that they have been wrong in teaching people how to do ablation all these years. And they would also have to admit that 95% of their OBGYN doctors cannot do excision. And there's, Nancy has a list of probably 200 doctors that she, uh, on the Nook list, um, who patients have had good experiences with. Um, Saeed has what, 15 docs in the US who are vetted? I think so. Oh, it's, 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 it's around 20 now. In the US? Yes, yes. Okay, so 20 docs in the US who have been vetted to do excision correctly. And so I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a political thing. I think that they are afraid of what would happen if they said you need to, you know, you need to have excision done by an expert. Um, but it, we should be able to create centers of excellence uh, for endosurgery and for pelvic pain. And um, we should have the backing of some national organization, but we don't. Um, and so I wish I could tell you why. I don't know why. Uh, hopefully we can, we can change this uh, and make a difference. I mean, there's nothing that I would love to do before I retire uh, more than, than create the idea that endo is just like oncology needs to be taken care of by experts and not regular OBGYNs. Excellent. Amazing. So the next question is about ruptured ovarian endometrioma. And the question is, how is it diagnosed? Is it like possible during surgery that you see a ruptured ovarian endometrioma and say it was ruptured? And can you tell how recent this was? So we can, so it is, it is pretty common in women with endometriosis, endometriomas, especially fairly large ones, to see this brown uh, spotting basically all over the whole abdomen and pelvis. And, uh, and what that means is that an endometrioma ruptured at some point in time or leaked, you know, it depends on, you know, rupture indicates that the, you know, the whole thing basically opened up. Probably what it did was it leaked a little bit and then that fluid got <laughs> out and into the, uh, into the um, peritoneal cavity and then stained <laughs> Uh, stay in the peritoneum and the reason that it's brown is it because it contains hemosiderin which is the breakdown product of blood and um, a lot of doctors will say oh there's endometriosis everywhere well they don't understand that that's not endometrioma e endometriosis it's the it's the breakdown product of blood from a leaking endometrioma um, so we frequently will go ahead and drain an endometrioma when we're in there just because it makes it easier to <coughs> easier to deal with it and then we can get on the inside of the cyst and peel out the cyst wall. Um, there's generally a, a place on the ovary where the outer surface of the ovary and the endometrioma are fused and so it's easiest if we just circumscribe that with cautery basically cut around that area and take out that whole fused area and then get to where there's a better tissue plane between the endometrioma and the, and the ovary. Right. All right. So based on that, like the spots, there might be a chance that someone can, can, can recognize the rupture. The next question is, some, there's, there's someone that asked, the first laparoscopy has been negative, but she has only seen one incision in upper abdomen is like how many incisions are needed to, uh, to for a thorough exploratory well so um a lot of gynecologists will put one incision in the belly button deep down in the belly button and then they'll put another incision super pubically so right on top of the pubic bone basically over the top of the bladder 
And most people that I used to know in the way that I was trained was that you would at least put, you know, two ports in that you would put one in for the camera and then you would put at least one other probe to push things around and, and look around with. Um, and uh, when, when I used to do laparoscopy and do operative laparoscopy before I started doing robotics, I would put two, two five millimeter ports on the side. So one basically right in from the hip bone and then one level with the belly button out more lateral. Um, so then there would be three uh, a minimum of three incisions. If you're going to operate laparoscopically, you got to you got to have three incisions. So if someone just has one, it means they at least they probably put the camera, but they didn't move tissues around. So that's probably something to think about. Yeah. Uh, so there's one person who has been your patient in 2020. Now she's worried about her daughter, which is 14 year old. Should she bring her in for an assessment or wait until she has some uh, symptoms or some issues? So first degree relatives of women with endometriosis have a seven times higher, um, a seven times higher uh, chance of having endometriosis. And so because of that, daughters of my, pa my patients always worry about their daughters. And generally what I tell them is to see how things go when they start having periods. Uh, if they have a lot of pain, um, to start them on birth control pills and see how they do on the birth control. Because that's kind of the, the first intervention that makes sense. Um, if that works and you can take away their periods um, and take away their pain, then great. They can stay on that till they want to start having kids. If they go on birth control and either they don't tolerate it or it doesn't fix their pain, then uh, I think it's appropriate to do a surgery. But I only think it's appropriate to have somebody who really understands endo operate on a 15 or a 16 year old. Um, because like I mentioned before, the, enemy, the, the disease process has not matured to the point where most people have learned what it looks like. And so uh, it is very early, the, the lesions look different and you have to have somebody who really knows what they're going to knows what they're doing in order to go in and take that out. Thank you. So the next question is there is from Stacy. So she's not nine years post surgery has had multiple treatments with intracellular cystitis and hypertonic floor. She has the same pain and she's 15 now. People are telling her there's nothing to do and she still has her ovaries. She, uh, What's the plan? Do you think she's, she needs to still find a specialist because she's still in pain? She has ovaries. Obviously, she is not relieved from that pain. That pain is severe. So she had excision by an expert or excision by a regular general gynecologist? I mean, that's... that's so that's, let's assume mm -hmm. in, the, in the first case, if it's excision by a general gynecologist, then she needs to see an expert. If she did have excision by an expert, but not have a presacral neurectomy and she has pain. It, it all depends on what the, what the sensation of pain is. So um, uterine pain is, it tends to be crampy pain in the central low pelvis. It can radiate outwards towards the hips. It radiates usually into the back. It often will radiate into the uh, upper uh, thighs anteriorly in the in the medial thighs um it tends to some people will have sharp pain uh from their periods from from uterine pain but but the majority of it is more of a crampy type thing it, it tends to be central in the pelvis but it can fill up the whole pelvis endometriosis tends to be more stabbing more burning more lateralizing although Central endometriosis, meaning endo in the cul-de-sac or on the uterosacral ligaments, can masquerade and, and seem the same as uterine pain. Um, so the question is, you know, what exactly is it that's causing pain? Um, I've had women come in and tell me, you know, if I, if I didn't think my, if I didn't know that my ovary was taken out, I would think that my ovary is causing me pain. And it turns out it's their hip. <clears throat> And so 
hip uh whether it's a, a labral tear so the labrum is the uh is the cartilage that basically deepens the socket and holds the ball in the socket of the hip joint uh labral tears and impingement can cause pelvic pain uh that feels like ovary pain and a lot of women will will have pain from their hips and they will think that it's uh that that it's um endometriosis or they'll think it's uh from their ovaries pelvic floor spasm can can happen in reaction to endometriosis or adenomyosis or just a plain old uterus that is unhappy um i've also seen people get uh, pelvic floor spasm and interstitial cystitis from things like ulcerative colitis. So, um, you know, anything that can cause pain in the abdomen can cause pelvic floor spasm, which then can cause interstitial cystitis. Interstitial cystitis is a, is a secondary pain generator that is, that is caused by, um, something called neurogenic inflammation and what happens is that when when the sensory nerves in the pelvis bring the the pain impulses or the nociceptive impulses into the spinal cord excuse me my uh everything is in bloom now and my allergies are acting up um so when when the when all this pain, painful uh, nerve traffic comes into the spinal cord, it co comes into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, and it's supposed to synapse or connect with the next neuron and then go up to the brain. Mm -hmm. The spinal cord's job is to protect the brain from too much of this, uh, you know, too much of these pain impulses. And so it kind of puts up a backstop. And then that, that, that excitatory signal coming in on the sensory nerve is actually, uh, you know, protons and electrons doing their thing. And it's got to go someplace, just like electricity. It's got to go someplace. It can't just stop. So it goes backwards on the sensory nerve that goes into the bladder or sometimes the pelvic floor and creates the inflammatory uh, condition uh, conditions that that uh, promote interstitial cystitis or pelvic floor spasm. There's a couple of different mechanisms that at play that you know that people have debated on exactly why, and we won't go into that. But but basically, it's a it's a reflexive kind of pain that can happen after any any kind of intra-abdominal thing. So if somebody's 50 years old, they could have diverticulitis. And that right. could be causing the pelvic floor spasm in the in the interstitial cystitis. It could be it could be the the origin could be nothing gynecological, but you have have to have somebody who understands the whole entire pelvis, which is why I think, you know, going back to my training and and what I always loved, uh, you know, having the urology background from the urogyne and then. Um, you know, loving general surgery. I spent a lot of time with the general surgeons in, in residency, and now uh, I work very closely with the general surgeon and have for about the last 12 years. And so understanding all of these facets of pelvic medicine and surgery, you know, is really important, which is, which is why we need centers of excellence. Absolutely. Thank you. So, I, so my suggestion as an MD, a general practitioner, is Probably you should go find a, a pelvic specialist who understands them. The next question is, uh, someone had excision last August and had COVID shot and has like spotting and PMS, but it still has the same pain. Does that mean she still has endo considering it was last August? So it's, we were still within like seven or eight months. Yeah, I mean, it all depends on the quality of the excision. Um, so... Again, assuming that it was good excision, then the question is, well, you know, is the pain really from endo? Um, or is it from your uterus? Or is it from ovarian adhesions? Or is it from your bladder? Is it from the pelvic floor? You know, where exactly is this pain from? And what's the nature of the pain? Regarding the COVID shot, I have heard and, and read 
in it's kind of buried in the articles, but um, information on patients having menstrual irregularities and spotting and heavier periods, irregular irregularities or uh, uh, you know, irregular periods after the COVID shot. I'm looking at this question that says, I was told by a urogynecologist that IC is no longer considered a disease. So IC was renamed IC slash PBS. Um, PBS is painful bladder sim syndrome, uh, not the uh, public television. Um, and so, uh, you know, whether it's a disease or a syndrome, um, you know, I don't know what the... I don't know what the difference is between a, a disease or a syndrome, but it, it is definitely real. And it is, uh, it is definitely something that urologists and urogynecologists should understand and should know how to treat. Um, it does not require a cystoscopy and hydrodistension to diagnose it anymore. All it requires is the clinical symptoms of pain um, pain in the region of, uh, of the bladder and uh, associated with urgency and frequency, I believe. Um, and uh, you can diagnose it with uh, Lowell Parson did a, uh, a, a very nice questionnaire that's called the Puff Questionnaire. And um, you don't need to do uh, installations with uh, potassium like we used to do and really piss people off. You don't even need to do installations with uh, lidocaine to see if the pain goes away. All you do is the puff questionnaire. If you score more than 20, you've got IC. Or just talk to your patients, you know, and if they, if they have pain with a full bladder and increased urgency and frequency, they feel like they've got a UTI, but they really don't, they've got culture negative. Uh, then they pro then they've got IC, so it's a clinical diagnosis, but it still is a real disease. Right. So, Dr. Mossberg, uh, we have so many questions here. We probably have to go through them a, a bit faster. I hope we can answer all of them. Let's see how many we can get down. Um, so, there is this other question that uh, should a proper endo excision by a specialist drastically reduce the pain? Or can central sensitization can c continue to cause the extreme pain? I know you answered that if you just quickly, because it's a specific question. I would appreciate that. I, I know you already explained that totally a few minutes ago. Um, I have had maybe somewhere in the ballpark of 3 to 5% of my patients still have persistent pain after excision of all visible and, uh, and then taking care of their uterine pain and everything. And so I, I do think that there can be a, uh, some, a, a very, very small subset of patients who have what's kind of like a complex regional pain syndrome in their pelvis. And for those of you who don't know, CRPS, uh, it used to be called uh, RSD, reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Now they've taken that name away because they don't think it's accurate. It's kind of like phantom limb syndrome where you get your arm mangled in an accident or, you know, you get hit by a train and your leg gets mangled, kind of like Tiger Woods did, and you have a whole bunch of surgeries and finally they decide it's so bad you got to chop it off and they cut it off, but you still have all that pain that you originally had because those nerve endings keep firing. And I do think that that can happen. Fortunately, it's rare. Um, and uh, so it's, it, but it, but it is probably the most challenging thing that I face when I can't really fix somebody. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so there is a slight chance, but still we need to make sure that's the excision done by an expert. So the next person is say like she lives in Washington, Washington State. She has out of network insurance coverage. Yeah, so we probably can call, reach out to Dr. Mosbrocker's office. They'll they'll coordinate care. Is there anything that you want to tell her, Dr. Mosbrocker? Uh, no, just I mean, you can go on our website or you can call, uh, and uh, the girls will, uh, you know, take it from there and get you set up with an appointment and let you know what we need. Thank you. Okay, awesome. So the next question is: Someone has the, a doctor has done endoablation two times. And she, the doctor has told this patient that because your endo are superficial, excision is not necessary. 
And this patient is obviously in more pain than, than she was eight years ago. Uh, like, what's the deal here? What, what, what does she need to do next? Stop listening to that doctor. <laughs> I mean, so, so, uh, so in the studies of ablation, uh, there, there are not a lot of studies uh, looking at ablation of endometriosis, but the ones that are there, um, one study showed that 50% of patients had pain return by six months after surgery. One study showed that 70% of patients had pain return by 18 months after surgery. Um, another study was done uh, that was uh, published in 2010 with a follow-up that was actually a randomized comparison study looking at excision versus ablation. <clears throat> they had the residents doing the surgery, so they did not have expert excision. And the, the study was powered for 75 patients in each group and only had 50 because of the dropouts. And so when they analyzed the data, you know, if all you read was the abstract in fertility and sterility, you saw, oh, there's no statistically significant difference in these two groups. But once you went into the, uh, to the actual data and you looked at the rates of the amount of improvement with defecatory pain, with um, pain with periods, pain with sex, pain with, you know, whatever you can imagine, there was a trend that the excision group had way better uh, pain improvement than the ablation group, but they didn't have the they knew that they didn't have the statistical power to get statistical significance. There was no way with 50 patients in each arm that they could ever reach statistical mm -hmm. significance. So I don't know. I don't know why they even published that study. Because to me, if I was an editor, I would say, you know, this is garbage, because, uh, you know, there's no way that you can prove a difference. And I think right. if they would add enough patients in that in that study, they would have shown it. Right. which is why we need to create a database side. I know, that's on me. And the other thing that I need to, I should add, based on my discussion with many doctors, because I'm trying to bring people, experts to learn, or if they already know the excision, many people decide to do ablation when they cannot do excision or they think excision is too risky. So mm -hmm. that's also something to be added here. Yes. So the other question is, do you accept cash patients? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So I'm going, the, the other, all right. So the other question is, um, someone is taking their daughter to a specialist because of her history. And she's taking to someone who is not a general gynecologist. Uh, because of the life experience, she learned that she doesn't go to general gynecologist and the patient and the daughter is 16 year old and she has had pain that has been escalating over the years does it mean that this patient automatically needs surgeries or or they should try hormones first you know i mean in a 16 year old i would probably try to see if we could try hormones, you know, if for no other reason than, you know, I mean, 16 year old girls, they're not all the same. You know, some of them come in with their teddy bears and, and some of them come in with their high heels and, um, and how they are emotionally, you know, whether or not they're emotionally ready for a surgery, I think partly plays into this. Um, but I would probably try to, uh, try to put them on birth control or, or at least some uh, strong progesterone um, for a while to see what happens. Um, but I don't think, you know, if somebody's had their period for say three years and they're 16 and they've got worse and worse pain and they're missing school and it's significant and their exam is consistent with endo, you know, I mean, I wouldn't twist their arm and make them go on birth control if they didn't want to but I would certainly offer it. Okay, cool. The other question that Stacy has asked, are doctors mandated to take, to take picture? Uh, so obviously she has never saw any pictures and she wants to know what's the protocol when they go for laparoscopy <laughs> or for robotics. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, they're they're not going to get sued if they don't take pictures, but it's kind of the standard. I, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say it's standard of care, but it's standard of practice that most patients who have laparoscopic surgery go on with pictures, um, at least for endo. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, I don't know. And, and then a lot of times pictures get taken, but they're stored in a different system than the electronic medical record system. And so they can't really, the, the system that takes the pictures and the EMR don't communicate. And so it's, unless you have hard copies, um, there's not really a good way to access those pictures later on. And so it is, it's challenging even for those of us who really try to take pictures, uh, the management of those pictures afterwards. Right. Okay. Great. So Dr. Moskrock, I know it's already past seven. There are some other questions. If you have a few more minutes, we can answer them. If not, we can have another live session at another time and answer those questions. Those sure, we can go a few more minutes. Okay, great. So someone has uh, has had a recent excision done by a specialist, and her question is, does the endo come back? And does, does the patient need to take meds to keep endometriosis away, any medication to, take the endo, to keep the endometriosis away? So in the almost 20 years that I've been doing this, I have had probably five or six patients who have had surgery either by me or Dr. Redwine, who do develop new endometriosis in the same spot that we have excised. That's it. And um, I've had probably that many patients who have had stage four disease who come back and, um, and say, you know, I'm almost embarrassed to say this because I feel so much better than I did prior to that excision but I've got pain right here. And they point with one finger to where they hurt. And, um, you know, when, when, when it looks like a bomb went off in your pelvis, you know, and you're operating for four, five, six hours, it is possible to miss a spot, you know, even if you get 99% of it out. And so I, I usually tell my patients, look, I may not get 100% of it out, but I'll get 99% of it out. Um, and so, you know, there's a, there's a small handful who do have recurrent uh, or uh, recurrent and then there's persistent disease. So recurrent disease is you took it all out and it comes back. Persistent is you missed a spot. Um, more important, I think, is women with uh, recurrent endometriomas. Um, that, I think, is, is the hardest area to treat in a way that, it, that the endometriomas won't come back. Because if you've got one endometrioma that you can see on the ultrasound, you might have one that's the size of the head of a pin and we're not going to see that on ultrasound. We're not going to see it intraoperatively because we, you know, we're not going to slice and dice the ovary open enough to, to see these tiny little areas. And so, um, so, you know, it is possible to have uh, an endometrioma removed and then a year or two later have a recurrent endometrioma. And, <coughs> So not only do cystectomies for endometriomas, you know, there's a risk of, of a, a recurrent endometrioma. There's also a risk that the ovary can stick down. Even if you suspend it, you know, there can still be adhesions from the ovary. So I would say my reoperation rate is somewhere around 5%. And most of those are for ovarian disease, either adhesions or endometriomas. It is controversial whether or not hormone therapy decreases the recurrence rates of endometriomas. Um, and the reason that I say that is because there are studies that show that it does, and there are studies that show that it doesn't, but there is no control for the quality of surgery that is done. So there are a lot of a lot of people that are just looking for, hey, how can I publish a study? Oh, let's look at, you know, recurrence rates of endometriomas. That doesn't mean that they are experts at removing the endometriomas and doing those cystectomies. So they may have missed a little part of the cyst wall. They may have missed a smaller endometrioma that's on another part of, uh, another part of the ovary. And so in, 
you know, for those cases, then yeah, sure, giving somebody uh, birth control or progestins probably will decrease the recurrence rate. Um, <clears throat> if somebody's got a tiny little endometrioma that, that, that I didn't get out, giving them uh, hormones will probably decrease the rate at which that tiny little endometrioma grows.